everyone. Welcome. I'm so happy you could join us today. Um, here to talk a little bit about Janssen Pharmaceutical and how we um, got, uh, are bringing our people and our data together to help our organization make decisions in a whole lot better ways. Um, my name's Amy. This is my co-lead, Sue. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the people and the adoption piece. Sue's going to be talking a little bit more about the data and some of the innovative solutions we've implemented. So just to give you a little bit about what we're going to talk about, um, we're going to start off, we're going to give you a little bit of background about Johnson & Johnson and Janssen, which we're part of. Then we're going to talk a little bit more about the people and about the data pieces. And then we're going to set sail on our journey. So this will be a quick overview of Johnson & Johnson for those who are not familiar with it. We're a global healthcare leader. We have more than 250 operating companies. Uh, we sell products in over 175 countries, and we have approximately 128,000 employees worldwide. The way we're organized is broken up into three sectors. We have a medical devices unit, a pharmaceutical unit, and a consumer unit. Um, and while we're probably best known for our consumer products, so Band-Aids and, and baby powder, really the bulk of our revenue is coming from our medical devices and from our pharmaceutical sector. A little bit about um, Janssen and where we sit. We sit in the pharmaceutical sector. Um, we had sales of about $28 billion last year in 2013 and growth of about 12%. Um, but beyond our financials, what's really great is we've been able to launch 13 new products since 2009, three of which have been new molecular entities. So those are novel solutions to treat diseases. So we're providing our doctors and our patients with a lot of other options. So enough about J&J, &J, a little bit about our project. So our project was called Envision, and it was bringing together the data warehouse piece as well as um, the data analytics piece. Um, there were about 10 of us that started off on the project. We were a mixture of IT and business people. We were doing the analysis for our senior leaders, and we were frustrated because we were using Excel, we were using PowerPoint. We couldn't actually get to the insights that we needed to get to in a really quick way. Um, so we went to some of our senior leaders, said, hey, there's got to be a better way to do this, faster, quicker, we can get you guys more decisions more quickly. They agreed that we could experiment um, and explore a little bit. And so we set down a path of doing about four or five different POCs with various um, data analytics tool. Um, what we found was Tableau really worked the best for our R&D data. And so that's what we went with. So. Convincing the 10 of us or so that, that that's what we needed to do was, was pretty easy, but convincing the rest of the organization, that's where the hard work came in. So we needed to actually get our organization on board with us. We needed them to see that there was a lot more power behind our data, and we needed them to leverage it. Um, so what we needed was a, a, an interesting model to do that. So in the title, we talked a lot about the Titanic, and we also talked about the love boat. So this is a little bit representative of the Titanic. You know, it's, it was heading on course. It was a big, it was a stable industry leader. We didn't want J&J &J to go down that same path. So we knew we needed to chart another course. Never know what's out there. We needed our data to work for us, and we needed to be able to identify risks in our data quickly um, so that we could avoid them. So what we did is we created a, an innovative learning model, and we broke our, our organization into um, five different communities. And they kind of break out into two different subsectors. We have our bottom liners and our drill downers. Those are our senior leaders and our managers who might drill into the data a little bit. And then we have our insiders, our visualizers, and our enforcers. Those are our authors. So those were the people that we really needed to focus on because we needed them to be able to provide the visualizations that our senior leaders our bottom liners and our drill downers we're going to be able to use to get to um, making the right decisions at the right time. So the innovative learning approach that we took, we dubbed Study Hall. And what we did is we actually brought together the analytical communities from our IT organization, from our functional areas, and from our business. Um, what we did is we put them together in cross-functional groups. We gave them a critical business problem that our senior leader identified, and we told them that they needed to solve it. So beyond the, the benefits of providing that value back to the business and giving them an answer to one of their critical business problems, there were some other benefits that we realized from this approach. So we got people who um, thinking about thinking about business problems in very different ways. So the way that we usually approach problems was, 
okay, I got this question from this leader, and I need to run out, and I need to solve it, and it needs to be turned around in five minutes. Um, we got people starting to talk to the senior leaders a little bit more about why they were asking for that and what they were going to do with the information. Um, so that, that, was, that was a great learning for us because it, it really started to change the mindset of our, of our analysts. Um, the, other, the other benefit was is we started building more relationships. So we got people working together who never, ever, ever would talk to each other. J and J were very siloed. Um, but, but getting people together and working together was huge for us because what we saw in the visualizations that came out is everybody brought a little different spin on it and so the visualizations that came out to answer those key business questions were really rich because they, they brought a lot of different thinking uh, to them. And then the last piece was shared learning. So what we found was um, everyone thinks they're, pro they're the only person with that problem, but by getting people together and talking about their problems, they realized that they weren't alone. And so then what they could start to do is work together to solve some of the, big, the bigger problems and really leverage that across. So the framework that we set up was pretty simple. Um, bring people together for four days. We taught them soft skills and technical skills um, with Tableau. We handed them that business question and then what what we did is we gave them a three-month period for which they had the time to work with data, work on the business question, work with the, with the senior leader um, to deliver, and we, and we delivered that in a show-and-tell audience. So we brought together the senior leaders, we brought together all the teams, um, and they presented back to the senior leadership, and the, and the results were really amazing. So we're actually implementing a lot of the visualizations that came out of those study halls now within our organization because they were so new. So we thought our model was pretty good, but we wanted to make sure that it was working. Um, so we followed our study hall participants. And what we found after that three, four month period is that we had about 20% of the people who were our early adopters. They went and ran with it. They liked the approach. They liked working cross-functionally. They would work with others on problems. We had about 65% who really liked the tool, could get into it, but they weren't ready to make that bridge. So what they did is they they took Tableau and they started using it to replace a lot of the Excel PowerPoint types of analyses that they were doing. And then we had the last 15%, which we dubbed as analytical laggers. It was important to have them there because we could have discussions with them and they could understand what was possible, but they weren't ever really going to go in and, and use the tool. So now we had this huge group of people that were all trained and all raring to go, and what were we going to do with them? So we needed to figure out a plan. So because of the approach um, with study hall, by pairing up some of those senior leaders with some of those people who were all into the analytics, we found that important. So we knew that getting people talking was really critical. Um, so we paired up some of those people who were our um, stars coming out of study hall. We understood where those needs were in the organization. We would pair them up and we would get them talking so that we could realize the value of the data visualizations faster. And the approach that we took was pretty simple. So we would we start with empathy. So it's all about the business needs, needing to understanding what the needs of our organization are. Um, our tendency is to jump to solution, and we're really taking a step back from that now and spending the time up front on the needs because we understand that we can get to solutions actually a whole lot faster, and they're going to be more fruitful and rich. The second piece is J&J is all about relationships. Um, more so even than data probably. So it's really important for us to understand what our customers value, um, as well as helping our customers see where the data fits together um, and what those relationships are so that they can see where they fit into the broader organization and where the questions that they're asking are some of the same questions that other people across the organization are asking. And then the last piece is making an engaging um, experience for them in de designing the solutions. So, um, instead of jumping right to the solutions, we get them engaged, we get them to co-create with us on what it is that they need. So having all this is great, but we knew that we were pretty green on all this, so we had had some Tableau training, but we needed more. Um, so what was critical was, you know, just like you wouldn't trust your Mai Tai to anyone other than Isaac, for those of you who love boat fans, um, we needed to have some outside help. So we did that in a couple of different ways. We brought in some data visualization experts. We brought in some technical experts. Um, and one of the things that we did was to have what we called Viz Challenge Sessions. So we would take a visual that's really ugly and unattractive, but that our business 
loves. So we would call it a go-to business fizz. And we would change that for them by having someone come in and show them how it could be better. So this is critical because our mindset is all in the Excel PowerPoint frame, mind, uh, mind frame. So we needed to get them to think about, OK, instead of this bar chart, you could do it this way. And now you can get even more information out. Um, so that was critical. The other thing that we knew we needed to have was a innovative training and con on-site consulting um, uh, approach. So we had used Innerworks. We had used another company, S2, to help us. We had a lot of phone support. But nothing really beats having someone like right there um, in the trenches with people. So we actually have a, a person, actually Jan Tanner, right there. He's, um, he's been on site and helping our group. And he's developed some really great tools um, from the basics, which is going to help your beginner. So giving them kind of the foundation for those people who couldn't attend study hall. And then creating additional trainings that are more tailored to topics that people are interested in. So they could come to Jan and say, hey, I want to know more about this. He'll throw together a little training for them and come to their group and train them on that. And then the last piece is for people who have a viz. And it's good, but they want to make it great. So in that case, someone can sit down personally, you know, with them side by side and help to make that viz a whole lot better. We call that our viz to viz process. So having all this great training within Janssen has been great, but j and is a big company, and we're exploding with Tableau. So I think in the three years I've been here, there may have been like two or three of us from J&J the first year, and now I think there's like 30 or something. So it's coming out. So we want to be able to share across the organization, um, and we're starting to do that a lot more. So we're having internal user group meetings that we're having. We're sharing information and training that's being created uh, across the board with the broader, with the broader organization. Um, one of the other things we're looking to implement um, is what we're calling Visual Cafe. So it has a very similar look and feel to Tableau Public. This was actually created pretty simply with a SharePoint uh, 2013 site. But it allows the end user, if they have a visual that they want to share out to the broader organization, just put it in, put the link from server in there, um, and then it will automatically pop up and people can come and look and see what, what they've done and steal ideas, things like that from there. So the last piece that we're starting to experiment now is with social media. So um, it's a little bit harder to get going, but we're hopeful that we'll, that we'll have some good success with that too. So the last piece that has been really critical is we have a strong core team. And the business is really gung-ho, and so oftentimes you can get people kind of going in, in various directions. So having that core team and, and that core team understanding what the destination is is really critical. Um, they help, we've been really helpful in, in providing frameworks to the organization, making people connect where they're not connecting, but where we see opportunities for them, them to connect, as well as to communicate back to the business what it is that they're actually going to be getting. Um, you know, in the past we've followed, we actually have not done a lot of self-service, so we've used a lot of IT, so it's a lot of technical documents. Uh, what we're trying to do is take an approach of where we can have a document that's kind of more user-friendly. So this is an example of um, a map that we threw together that's going to go back to the business on how we execute on our, on our portfolio. Um, so what it does is it kind of gives high-level um, buckets for, for the types of analyses that we're going to get as well as to provide a little bit of um, business question or context around what's in there. And just to give an example, um, we then go down into you know, what are those business questions that are going to be answered? What are the data elements that we're going to need to measure? What are some calculations that we'll need to look at? And then what are some of the data attributes that we need? So we found this is to be a, a pretty effective tool so the business really understands what it is they're getting instead of giving them a big, long, services or I don't even know, an IT, big long IT document um, that's really hard for them to navigate. Um, so now that you know a little bit about how we've been building our community, I'm going to turn it, turn it over to Sue, my, my co-lead here, and she's going to talk a little bit about the data and some of the innovative approaches we've taken in execution. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the operating model and how our core team has worked with our internal resources as part of this deployment. So what you see up here was our original ecosystem, how we managed across the organization. We, we called them pods, which really were just kind of cross-functional teams of people working together. 
uh, our core team sat in the middle and really facilitated conversation and coordination across the different pods. We focused both on the enterprise portfolio level, across the different therapeutic areas, and as well as on the functions. Uh, so this is, this is where we started. Um, we did actually switch this up a little bit. Um, two years into the project, it was time for a change. So why did we change? Well, we had more users than we ever had before. We realized there were a lot of complexities in our data structure um, that we, we needed to focus more attention on as well. And really, you know, there was a difference in skill set between the people who were designing and building the visas and those who really understood the organization and were delivering um, throughout. So here's the new operating model that really reflects those learnings. Up at the top, we have a group that we call the deliverers. In the middle, we have the designers, and then down at the bottom are the data gurus. The deliverers are the people who are working most closely with our end users, really understanding the business needs. Um, they then interact with the designers who are in the middle swim lane here. Uh, these folks are helping to design the visas and the workbooks. Uh, then the role that we neglected to really um, nail down the first time we came up with our operating model was this team of data gurus. So how do we come up with a consistent data approach that can be used through all our visualizations and reports that we're building and delivering to the organization? So to us, that was a real benefit to formalize that role and add that into the operating model. So this just basically shows the framework of how we're executing. Uh, and you'll see these different roles as they sit throughout. It's definitely a bit of an eye chart, but I'll just kind of walk you through at a high level. Starting in the discovery phase, um, actually the example that Amy showed you where we looked at the beginning of, of that storyboard, there were all kinds of questions and uh, work done up front by that uh, deliverer group to really understand how the business makes their decisions, start to ask questions and under, understand and empathize with the need. Next comes the prototyping, where it's a really hands-on coordination between the deliverer and the designer, building out that storyboard of which you saw a screenshot. And here's where the data guru starts to get involved, definitely way up front, identifying what are the different attributes that you want to include in that storyboard and how are those different data elements connected. From there, this moves into the proof of concept phase where we put together a working model of the VISA report, start to really socialize that within the organization. We also have what we call a doc squad. And here's where we bring in a bit more of the traditional IT uh, SDLC roles. So we know that in order to be able to properly support all these visas once they're deployed, we need a good level of documentation. Uh, so this doc squad really plays a role of a business analyst who understands what's being built and makes sure that we have enough so that we can support these once they are deployed. So they really get involved at the POC stage to make sure that we have all the details ironed out. Uh, we move into deployment and uh, we always try to do a soft deployment first to a limited user base really keep our thumb on things like performance, make sure that we have um, all the right elements in there for, for a successful adoption. We may iterate a bit based on that, which I'm sure is very natural. Um, then eventually moving into our steady state full deployment to the entire user, user base. Okay. Uh, so the next piece I'm really gonna talk about is our data strategy and also what we call our enabling technologies. So Tableau is a great tool. We've, we love using it within our organization, but we've built some additional pieces around it to make it more of a, a robust type of suite. So I'll show you a little bit about how we've done that. So this really shows our end-to-end -end strategy and framework. Um, on the very left, you'll see the different inputs. These are the different types of data that our organization works with. Um, a lot of planning and project information, finance information, as well as operations. All those on the left flow into an operational data warehouse uh, just to make our project a little bit more complex. Not only are we working with the different visuals, we're also working on moving that data warehouse from an Oracle to a Teradata based um, platform. So we're, we're kind of uh, doing this implementation with a moving target in front of us. Uh, that operational data warehouse acts as the single source of truth from which our uh, visualizations are fed. The other part we're working on, we're not quite there yet, is the workflow and delivery mechanism. So we're also building an interface that we're calling a user community tool. So in addition to posting the visualizations up to Tableau server, we wanna really integrate that a bit more into a portal look and feel. 
so what we'll have is the SharePoint 2013 implementation that we've just started. Uh, and essentially we'll have different pages for all the, all the visualizations posted up there. And we'll be able to really have some conversations around what, what we're seeing in that data. What are the different insights um, and create some communities around that. That also kind of goes to the arrow flowing back. Uh, we're never really done, so as we start to build out the visuals, I'm sure we'll start to identify other areas, um, different attributes that we may want to collect and report on. So the flow definitely will go back and be iterative. Uh, so a little bit about our data architecture. As I shared, uh, we basically have two main sources, which is our planning and our finance data. Uh, that flows into our data, data warehouse that feeds data marts. From there, we actually use Tableau data extracts. If you don't know much about them, I'd really encourage you to go to a session this week to learn a bit more about them. Um, we really uh, think it's added a lot of value to our organization. I'll tell you a little bit more in the next few slides. Something special that we've done in addition to that we call FlexMart, um, which really is just a flexible data mart. So we also deal with some data that doesn't live within our data warehouse. Maybe it's some external benchmarking data, for example. Um, at a big company like J&J, &J, if we acquire another product, it will really take some time to get all that information, model it, and put it into our warehouse so we can start reporting on it. So having a FlexMart really just gives us a single source of truth, so one area where all the authors can access through a Tableau data extract and bring those other elements into their reports by blending it with our um, uh, data mart fed uh, Tableau data extracts. Okay, so I gave you a little uh, teaser of how we use t uh, TDEs and how that fits into our data strategy. Um, most of our TDEs uh, come directly from our operational data warehouse. We also have a real-time connect to information um, that you'll see in some screenshots in just a little bit. Um, that we call our qualitative information database, and that data is real time. Um, if you choose to use some TDEs, uh, this will give you a couple of tips and tricks um, as to how they would benefit your organization and things to think about as you're implementing them. Um, what we've found uh, is that they definitely help us to increase performance. Um, it's a place where we can really support the self-service authoring. So we will be able to uh, build and create some standard calculations that can be then leveraged across multiple authors, uh, as opposed to putting that into the workbook itself, uh, which could impact performance. We can also define different hierarchies and dimensions, et cetera. We can combine them in a nice way, doing some blending. Uh, it's pretty simple to administer. Um, one nice thing is different data refresh rates can be supported as well. So for some Tableau data extracts, our data warehouse actually updates on a nightly basis, so that information could be updated every day. Um, the FlexMart piece, some of that data we only get every six months or even on an annual basis. Uh, so for that TDE, we probably wouldn't refresh it as frequently. And last but not least, you can apply a pretty flexible security model using Tableau data extracts, uh, using some filters and things even down to the, to the user or attribute level. Okay, so now that I've talked a little bit about our data, I wanted to show these other kind of supporting technologies that we've built around Tableau uh, to give it a more robust type of look and feel. Uh, the first one that we heard a need within the business, we said, okay, great, we have all these attributes in our data warehouse coming from our planning and our finance systems, but what about some qualitative information? I have some commentary that I want to add to this. How do we really blend data that's not in our warehouse with what is actually sitting in there. So uh, we built what we call the qualitative loop solution, which allows us to integrate the information either at the entire visual level, so you could create a comment that applies to the whole workbook, or for a specific data point within that workbook. And the other requirement we heard was, that's great, I want to be able to enter that and then immediately see that refreshed on the viz. So uh, before I show you what we did, we're actually on our second iteration of this as well. So I wanted to share this as a lessons learned if it's something that you're interested in bringing into your organization. We first started with version one. So over on the left, kind of tying back our Titanic reference here. Um, it was a little bit rigid, inflexible. Uh, it was SharePoint based. We had some issues when we had concurrent users going in trying to add information at the same time. 
uh, we moved to a .NET form, which is more integrated with our Tableau solution. Uh, definitely a little bit more sexy, smart. It has spell check, um, conditional logic throughout the form. Uh, Mrs. Garrison, probably not the sexy one on the picture on the right, but uh, Heather Locklear, perhaps. <laughs> Okay, so a little bit about the qualitative architecture overview. Some of this you already saw. So our, fi our finance and, and planning systems feeding into the warehouse, then we have our data marts, the qualitative data mart as well, which is a separate um, Oracle database, uh, feeding the TDEs and then into the workbooks. So what we actually have is from the workbook itself, the users are able to click a hyperlink, um, which basically opens the web form Data then gets passed through parameters uh, into the, the .NET solution into the qualitative uh, form, saved back to the data mart with a particular data element. So I'll kind of walk you through it in the next few slides. Unfortunately, I had to hide some of the information so you don't steal all of our trade secrets. But uh, let me kind of orient you to what this is. Um, what, we, what we see here is we call it our operations dashboard. So we use this across our different therapeutic areas at Janssen. Um, you could come in here. Uh, once a month, a lot of these, these teams report back to their governance groups. And this is essentially a dashboard view where you can easily take a look across all the different projects that you're monitoring and in a visual way see um, yellow, green, or red traffic light indicators telling you if you have issues related to timing, resources, or budget for your given project. Um, if you do have issues, um, you'll see little check marks kind of identifying the different area where, where we have that issue. So this has actually become a very popular uh, dashboard design that we've implemented a few other times for uh, other groups within the organization as well. So anyhow, for each of the projects that we have on here, um, in this example, we came in and we uh, went ahead and filtered to just look at all of the different projects that sit under the immunology therapeutic area. And we came up with um, IDP, which is just our unique identifier, for 1111 and 1212. So the user would come in, click on either of those, and it actually opens up a one-pager. So now, for this given project, here's more detailed information about it. Some of this data comes from our operational data warehouse, from our planning system. So everything on the top left in the project summary section comes from that data source. Uh, we also can integrate our finance data here from our warehouse as well. And then we have milestones and all of those dates are interactive. You can hover and, and click on the different milestones in that section, also coming from our planning system. But now you want to do some issue reporting. So what we've added is a little button that just you click to add an issue. And then here's our qualitative entry form. Because we were on project 1212, this opens up. We'll pre-populate that information for you. Just kind of go down the, down the field, um, give the, the, the category of the issue, a description, continue down the form, um, what's the source, and then you'll see down here uh, under the milestones, resources, and budget where you can give it the different indicators for the traffic lights. When you've finished, click the OK button, and those parameters get passed back to the qualitative database and stored with that uh, 1212 project. To the user, they just have to click the OK button to confirm, and then they get back to the Tableau one pager. Click the refresh button up at the top, and you'll see now we have those issues actually appearing right on the screen. So it really is a nice, a, a nice way to integrate. Uh, that information right onto here and blend it with the information coming from that warehouse. Now, once a month, these are generally updated in preparation for those governance discussions. Uh, so the next month, you would just come in here, hover over the existing issue, click the link, edit it, and uh, continue through that cycle. A uh, little bonus that we added here is that um, because we have a lot of different um, governance and reporting boards, you can actually use that one form to feed multiple Tableau workbooks. So we've had some savings for sure with um, our, our project managers only needing to update one web form instead of multiple PowerPoint slides or Excel spreadsheets as they used to. Um, it's also helped us to avoid the icebergs. So by mixing that data, it really has given us more visibility into being 
um, you know, proactive and help to mitigate those issues as they crop up. Again, driving the right conversations so we can course correct. So that was our qualitative enabling technology. The other one I wanted to focus on today we call batch print and custom print. So even though we have a tool like Tableau, which is great, it's interactive, it's driving conversations and discussions and meetings, we come from a big company with a very um, sort of conservative culture where they're used to PowerPoint, they're used to printing. So when they go into a governance meeting, they want to take their slides with them and write the notes. So um, there's, there are some challenges when you try to print directly from Tableau. So we've worked out a way to, uh, to build some, some custom print to help there. So some of the requirements we heard from the business are, well, I want to print all the data. You can't truncate it. So that, that's a bit of a challenge when a lot of the features include hover overs and drill downs. I want to be able to interact with that visual and only print what I've filtered. And in addition, I want to be able to schedule some of that um, so that you know once a month or once a week, whatever that, that uh, timing is, to do it automatically and then upload it somewhere and I'll just, I'll just download that. So based off of those requirements, uh, this is the architecture we came up with. Essentially, it's three different areas that you see here in these different verticals. There's a user web interface, a .NET application server, and a Windows job. So we have leveraged the, the Tableau JavaScript API um, as part of that web interface to .NET, um, and as well as some of the, the command line functionality um, in the Windows job at the end as the data gets consolidated to a PDF and then stored to a SharePoint location where the user can retrieve that. So here's what it looks like. Uh, again, I'll take you back to the same visual. This is our ops dashboard again. Um, from that same landing page we saw before, uh, there's a little button that just says batch printing. And when you click that, we have um, basically here's where that JavaScript API comes into play. So we're actually able to interact with the, with the viz, go ahead and filter for your particular therapeutic area and select all the different projects you're interested in putting into the batch print job. Once they're selected, you just click a button to initiate that. It will give you a confirmation of the different projects you selected. And then by default, whoever is initiating the print will be uh, part of the notification recipients. So basically, as soon as that happens in the background, you don't have to sit there and wait as it's pulling everything together. It will send you an email notification with a link to that SharePoint location that it uh, has sent your batch print. In addition, you could add other recipients if you wanted to have an admin on your team or someone also receive that notification. So kind of go through, configure that, and then just click the Submit button. It will tell you it's successful. If not, you know there's an issue, and then there's a link you can go to for some help. And you'll get an email, and voila, take you right to a SharePoint repository where you can find your PDF that's been delivered there for you. And open it up, and you'll see here that the sections of the viz that were interactive, um, you may remember the first time I showed this screenshot, this section down here that had all the different milestones and timelines included a scroll bar. Um, now you can see all that information that is here without being truncated, as well as all those qualitative issues that we added. We didn't want that information to be truncated and, and chopped off from the, from the print view. Okay, so uh, we, we took some metrics here and the results of initiating this batch print. Uh, before, it was two to three hours to compile uh, doing individual prints and then putting them in PowerPoint slides to deliver them that way. After, probably less than five minutes. Um, this is done in each therapeutic area, probably twice a month or per reporting cycle, so the savings just kind of, uh, you know, goes up from there. So definitely has brought some efficiencies to this reporting process. Okay. So hopefully uh, you've learned a little bit on your, your cruise with Amy and I today. We want to thank you for coming and learning t you know, some of the stories, uh, parts of our implementation. Hopefully we can help you avoid some of those icebergs as, as you uh, embark on your own journeys. And uh, yeah, open for any questions. Open for questions.
Absolutely. Yep, we'll include our email as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, over here. Other questions? Over here. I think we're up to 150 desktop licenses now. Um, and then I don't know the number of users. Um, so our potential user base um, by the end of next year is several thousand. I think um, interactors today, a few hundred. Yeah, that's right. Sure. Okay. Oops. Oops. Over here. Yeah, you had to have really... Sorry, did everybody hear her question? Should we repeat it? Oh, sorry, yeah. It, it was about how did we get um, buy-in to put people into a four-day session, both from the analysts and from our senior leaders, and also to get the senior leaders bought into working with the analyst, I think. So, yeah, it was, it was actually tough. Um, I went to, I'm in the project management organization, and, and our VP was very, very supportive, but some of her directs were less supportive, and she uh, really kind of put the hammer down. And I think um, now the person who was less supportive is totally on board. So um, the approach that we took was early on, we had a couple of people go into Tableau and build some visuals um, that were pretty powerful and helpful for the senior leaders. So we got them on board early before we kind of threw study hall at them. And the study hall approach, I think we got a, a lot of buy-in from the analysts because we made it very different than your traditional training. So we'd start off every morning with a huddle where we did something fun to kind of get your body and your mind moving. We made um, buttons. We made it all school themed. So we gave everybody backpacks. We, gave, we made buttons with this awesome program called Classmates where you could put like wigs on people. <laughs> so we got people really engaged and excited about something new and different. And then I think once they got into the class, they got to see some of the value that could be returned. And then getting people aligned with your senior leaders always gives a lot of incentive to deliver and deliver quality um, and, and provides that accountability. So um, it took a lot of communication. So I spent a lot of time communicating with the senior leaders, trying to get them on board, making sure that they were engaged, um, and, and really trying to help them see the value. And, I, and just to add to that, I think that the show and tell that we did at the end really demonstrated, you know, the outputs of all the work and effort that the people put in, not just in the four days, but in the, in the several months after that as they worked on their teams. Yeah. And we were showing our senior leaders on our investment committees how they could quick see MPVs, things that they're, like, spending hours doing that they could get like that. And it was just, I mean, the VPs were standing up going, we need this, like, right now, you know. So... Any other questions? Yep. Good, good question. So uh, the question, just to repeat it so everybody can hear it, uh, was a bit about the operating model and just resourcing for that. So do we have dedicated resources who are designing the visuals, probably um, you know, in that support data guru role, et cetera? So uh, maybe I can flip back to that quickly. Yeah, j just to add to that from the designer standpoint, what we did is we, we leveraged some of the folks from our study halls who were the people who really stood out. Um, and we got them to, to play that role. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, up at the top, the deliverers and the designers. I think a lot of those people, as Amy said, probably came out of, of the training from study hall. Uh, the data gurus, uh, that was a, a big learning that we didn't initially include in our operating model. Uh, that team, they are, they are dedicated. Um, basically, they, they came from within the organization already where, where we had people sort of playing that role, just not in a very formalized way. Uh, so, so that became the data guru team. Um, in terms of other groups that are involved in the end-to-end -end execution, uh, our doc squad or business analysts, most of them are um, contract people that we have. 
her over here. So the question was, how long did it take to change from the old model, the pod model, to the new model? Um, what well, we had delivered a few of the visuals with the old model, and then after study hall, we had about 90 people, and there was starting to be that groundswell, um, which was not sustainable. The other thing that we found with our original model was that um, the folks who were working in the therapeutic areas were trying to build almost the same visuals that someone from a functional area was trying to build, which was almost the same as what someone from a portfolio. And be because they were somewhat separate entities, it was difficult to keep them all aligned. So what we did is we took the approach of, okay, if instead of having a budget versus actual that's coming out of a function or, or um, a TA, let's get someone in a, in a designer mode working with a deliverer who might sit in any one of those functions, and then those designers understand all of the visuals that are being asked for, so it's more consolidated and, and less kind of sporadic, easier to manage. That was, that was the intent. Sure. Yeah. There was one whole day where there was no tool involved. So one day where it was about use of color, use of what's the right type of chart for this type of analysis. We did some things in there with that, like one of the things we called was what's up with that viz, where we had people from the organization provide us visuals that were really, really horrible, basically. And then we gave them to another team and we said, tell us what's happening in this visual. Like, what is the message here? And people struggled and they couldn't, right? So it was really kind of eye-opening to the business to say, wow, maybe what we're doing really isn't effective. Um, so that whole first day was all about that learning of, you know, what's, what's, what are the best practices, what types of um, you know, theory, more theory. And then we had two days where we just had the standard fundamentals class come in, so we had trainers come in and do that. And then on the last day, we kept the trainers around, um, and we had them, we broke out into those cross-functional team, we gave everybody a, a question, we had the senior leaders on site there with them, and they worked in a small group to start to draw out, okay, what is the question, asking more questions around those questions, and then starting to, to draw out um, what those might look like. Kind of hackathonish, yeah, but but in one day, and then and then we gave them, what we did is we gave them access to um, to Interworks and to some of our on-site help, um, so that they wouldn't feel alone and get frustrated and then not want to pursue it anymore. We wanted to make sure that that support was right there, so that the teams had what they needed in order to deliver at the end of the day. Sure. Yeah, it's small right now, so we're using it just, oh, I'm sorry. So the question was about sharing and the visual cafe that we were showing. So we're just kind of kicking that off now, and what we've done is we've utilized data um, that's not really J&J &J data, but is but it's interesting to J&J &J people. So um, a, lot of the, a lot of the visuals that are up there now are from clintrials.gov. So it's important for us to understand what our competitors are doing. Um, but what that does is it provides a nice overview for someone who maybe is looking at planning and wants to know how to build a really nice interactive Gantt chart. Um, so it, 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 gives, it gives a little bit more. But I think where we'll probably get the most will be sharing things that aren't sensitive not sensitive data, but data that just might be useful to grow it that way. Um, it's, it's amazing, though. We're really seeing a cultural shift in, in how open we are across the board in this space. So, and I think J&J &J as a whole is, is becoming more of one J&J. &J. I think we have to in order to be effective. Yeah. yeah, and just to add to that, even though we are part of the, of the, of the pharma industry, um, the data that we work with is not as regulated and restricted, so I think folks are more apt to, to want to share it than, than maybe other parts of our, even our own organization might be. Yeah, we're sharing business data, not so much, no real patient data or anything like that. It's all Correct. business data. Yeah. Any other questions?
So the question was about lessons learned. Um, yeah, I think from an adoption um, standpoint, um, people are engaged. I think what we having having access to someone on site is is critical, and also having those people who understand the data model is critical. Um, so that data guru piece that came in that Sue was mentioning that we missed up front, that's been brought in because our, our authors are struggling with how can we, you know, we don't maybe know our data. The other thing is that now we're looking broadly across, right? So where it used to be finance, this is our finance data, this is our PMO data, you know, this is our procurement data, we're making that more broad and available to everyone. So um, making sure that someone really understands the data model and the attributes and how that data all blends together um, has been, is critical. So I think that's probably one of our biggest lessons learned through this implementation. Sorry, my battery died. Um, we didn't initially start out building Tableau data extracts or using that sort of FlexMart concept. Um, and we found it from the business side, it was really just hard to get our data. Um, definitely a, a big challenge. So um, that's really helped us uh, to, to have that central place for authors to start to, to, to build out their workbooks through the Tableau data extracts. I'd say that was definitely a big lesson learned. Um, as well as you know working with our data warehouse team. It's, it's more of a traditional type of SDLC. It takes a lot of time to get elements added. So the FlexMart gives us a lot of flexibility. So if, as I mentioned, if we acquire another com company or there's a new piece of data that we need to integrate, until that becomes part of the warehouse, the FlexMart can also act as a great interim solution, you know, not just a, a long term. So I think a lot of the data was a big lesson learned. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming.